be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with psalms. When you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation and have made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you have united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfill the words of the prophets, enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, Christ our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light. To our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you, May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
enter with the saints into heaven's lasting joy. Lord, may your cross guard your holy faithful church everywhere throughout the world. Keep all scandal far from her. Keep her free from harm and strife, that your lasting peace may reign for all ages yet to come. May the children of the church find their shelter in their strength. Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of this incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Kaddishat, Aloho Kaddishat, And they give us the mysteries through the power of your cross. Lord, your cross is a ladder leading us to heaven's heights. May your church and her children join the angels A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in some transgression, you, who are spiritual, should correct that one in a gentle spirit, looking to yourself so that you also may not be tempted. Bear one's, one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone 
thinks he is something when he is nothing, he is deluding himself. Each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason to boast with regard to himself alone, and not with regard to someone else. For each will bear his own load. One who is being instructed in the word should share all good things with his instructor. Make no mistake, God is not mocked. For a person will reap only what he sows, because the one who sows for his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows for the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not grow tired of doing good, for in due time we shall reap our harvest, if we do not give up. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially to those who belong to the family of the faith. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Lomoel Kolochun From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Matthew, who proclaim life unto the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, It shall be as when a man who was going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to a third one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received a two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. And he said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. And his master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I shall place you over great. Come, share in the joy of your master. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward, 
And he said, Master, you gave me two talents, and see, I have made two more. And his master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I shall give you great responsibilities. Come, share in the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward, and he said, Master, I knew you were a demanding man, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you had not scattered. So out of fear, I went off and I buried your talent in the ground, and here it is back. And his master said to him in reply, You wicked and lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter. Should you not then have put my money in the bank so that I could have got it back with interest upon my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he shall grow rich. But from the one who has not, even that which he has shall be taken away. And throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and bless you. To him who has, more shall be given, and he shall become rich. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So last week we spent considering the ten bridesmaids, and what is the notion of unction, what is this oil that they bring, the wise ones, since they all fall asleep while they wait for the coming of the bridegroom. So that parable is immediately before the one that we have today, which is why it continues on, the line begins by saying, and so it shall be with the kingdom of heaven. What he's explaining is the ten wise, excuse me, the five wise and the five foolish versions. He's giving now another parable to get another angle to why some of these people, some of these women were wise and some of these women are foolish. So what is it that we're supposed to be doing? What is that oil? So last week, we gave a consideration and meditated on this unction, this oil that we brought with us in preparation for the day of the return of our Lord as being the clarity of will, the clarity and the purification of our intentions, of what we do to accomplish. Even if they seem small, they always have a great meaning beforehand. This week it's a bit more clear because here you have very much the parable is on what you're doing while you're waiting. What are you supposed to do when the master has distributed? Each, according to his ability, has distributed these talents. And I mentioned to you before when we, when we cover this gospel, the word talent we think about now as being the word for quality or characteristics or a skill. But in fact, the word talent at the time of our Lord is a weight. It's a measurement. It's a weight which is used, gold and silver, for example, at the time of our Lord, the interpreters will give that a talent was 75 pounds of silver. So this is actually quite one talent. When you first read five, two, and one, you think, oh, well, the one just got one. It's not a big deal. Well, even 75 pounds of silver still has a rather large sum amount as a value. And so here, the important thing that we first have to consider in the parable is that each one is given not according to the generosity of the master, but according to their abilities. 
And of course, as we know in the story, they go out and the five, the five and the two, they generate, they double what they have. Well, we miss also in the parable, and someday we'll actually do a conference or something, we'll talk about the question that this master is actually unjust because he's expecting a return on something that he's not doing anything for. That they're supposed to do something and make it productive. We're not told what they do. But we are told by the third man that he's afraid of his employer. He's afraid of the master. And he tells us why. Because you reap where you haven't planted. And you take up things that you've not laid down. You expect to find a return on something that you are not working for. And of course, there's only so much in the world of wealth. And so if everyone is receiving something producing from, say, a farm, that's one thing. But someone who just parks money somewhere in the way we do modern systems of economics, it's actually the injustice that you see here with the third man. You harvest where you have not planted. You take up things that you have not laid down. And so I was afraid. And I took your 75 pounds of silver and I buried it to make sure you'd get it back when you came. And he is blasted. You wicked and you lazy servant. You knew that I was exigent. You knew that I was demanding and you did nothing. And then in this key on this aspect, he says you should at least put it into the bank, into the exchange, so that something could have been gotten back. The parable is not about economics. The parable is about what we do with the things that have been given to us in trust. The five wise and the five prudent, the five wise and the five foolish bridesmaids are so because they've not prepared, they have no vision for the future, that when the bridegroom comes, in other words, the day of judgment, they're not ready. In this parable, immediately following, we're told how you become ready is while we wait for this long time before the master returns, we have these things that have been confided to us, our lives, our intelligences, our wills, we have some dominion over things, depending upon birth of our family or where we're from. But again, that's only for a time. God ultimately is the only owner of anything. You get things from your grandparents, they pass them on to your parents, they pass them on to you, and each of us will die and hopefully they have something that we pass on to others. But in the end, it is the most perfect description of why we cannot cling to the things of this world. The wicked servant is wicked because he hasn't done anything with the confidence that was shown to him by the master. He is, even if it's one talent, still a significant amount of money and still indicating the confidence that the master has in him. Anything that is given to us, anything that we have among those possessions, the acuity of intellect, the freedom of our will, the desire for beauty, virtue, justice, all of these things are given to us as gift. And it's very clear in this parable, you have to do something more with them so that when our Lord returns, you have something to actually say, I've done something with this, and not hear a rebuke of being wicked and lazy. And so when we look at this, the thing that I wanted to give you an application today was on the understanding of why we have the creed at Mass. Why do we recite this creed every single day? It is linked, the creed is linked with the sign of peace, or the kiss of peace, as we call it also. Because they are the reception of the things, they indicate liturgically the reception of the things, of the talents that have been given to us. So these talents are confided all to the employees, if you want, of the master. They're all given these things in confidence to trade with, to make them grow. And so our Lord is also giving us these things as the body of Christ also. We receive the faith. The faith is not about me. Everyone talks about religion these days as if it was something that I personally create for myself and my consolation. Of course, it's absurd. It is the way people talk, but it's absurd. The faith is a corporate reality. 
It is given to us in trust, which is why we recite the creed itself liturgically together. It acknowledges that unity of the one faith that has been confided by generation to generation, person to person, down through these centuries. So we recite the creed. And the sign of peace, that is the reception, excuse me, the, the creed is the reception of this faith that we receive from God. But the sign of peace is that peace of Christ which flows out from our Lord, which is why you've noticed in the Maronite tradition, liturgically, what we do. The peace flows from the altar in every single rite. And all of the rites originally have a connection with the altar at the sign of peace. It's not a meet and greet. It's not waving across the room to Sally because you haven't seen her in 30 years. It is the flowing of the grace of Christ that flows from the divine altar in the Eucharist outward to all the members. That is why the servers will come down and go row to row and you turn to the person and you're not saying, hi, it's good to see you, good morning. You're supposed to be saying, peace be with you. The peace that you have received from the ministers of the altar that you receive, you turn to the person next to you and you say, peace be with you. And they say to you and with your spirit. That is the way it's supposed to be done. And of course, before the apocalypse, we actually touched in that physicality of contact where the person that would come to you, the servers would come down, go to the people at the end of the pews and say, peace be with you, with their hands out. And you would put your hands on the outside of their hands and pull back and with your spirit. And then turn to the next person with your hands out, peace be with you. They place their hands on the outside of your hands and with your spirit. Now obviously with the apocalypse, we've stopped touching hands. That's why, but there's still a bow. It still has that understanding. So I wanted to describe a bit more about it to understand it. It is exactly the same thing in the Latin tradition also, and all the churches have the sign of peace. And it was before, for the Latins, of course, in all of us, it was a true kiss. And so the Latin gesture is actually hands on the shoulders of the person that you're going to receive. The person who's receiving puts their hands under the elbows, and you say, peace be with you. And the other person says, and with your spirit. And historically, it was a kiss on the cheek. Now, this is the reason why from antiquity and from many places up until even the 1960s, like in Ireland, you had women on one side and men on the other side. For the reason being, it seems somewhat unfitting to be giving a kiss on the cheek to somebody else's wife. And so you had men on one side, and it also comes from the synagogue. The synagogue had the, the sexes separated and sitting differently. It was just considered more discreet, more modest. But this is the sign and the kiss of peace is the foundation of the peace that flows, and it is the fraternal reception of the peace liturgically expressed. These are the things that have been confided to us. These are the talents that have been given to us expressed liturgically. So it's a very beautiful gesture. So when we start the creed, they used to be together. Over the centuries, they wound up being split a bit by the entrance, by the offertory, and then the sign of peace. But they, they are essentially originally together for that reason of what has been confided to us. It is the way we gather up our oil in preparation for the day of judgment. And it is a way that we also show in the confidence that God has given to us to entrust with us so many beautiful things in our lives. I know I, I know all of us, we tend to see what is bad and broken and we'd like to grape and wine. But in fact, when we're honest to ourselves, our lives are filled actually with a lot of beautiful things. We may not think our lives are beautiful altogether, but when we're honest to ourselves, there are a lot of beautiful and wonderful things that happen in our lives every day if we have eyes to see. And so in that reception of the talent, we express it liturgically of what we have received in the apostolic faith. And from that peace which flows from Christ himself, we share this fraternally with one another in the divine liturgy. This is the way that we prepare ourselves. And when we receive these gifts of grace, then we have great consolation to know that the parable that finishes by our Lord saying, and to the one who has, 
more shall be given, and they shall be truly rich. But to the one who has not, the one who is stingy and mean and self-centered and always about me and looking out for me and what's in it for me, that one who has little, even the little that he has shall be taken away. And so on that day of judgment, we hope to be among those who are rich so that we can hear those magnificent words, well done through your 89 years. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the small things I've given you during your life. So now, come, I place you over great. Ultimately, over all the things that belong to God. We considered that last week. So come and enter into the joy of your master. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you, honor their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, St. Mary, St. Jude, and St. Tarith. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed. Remember those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for all the intentions of the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord.
Lord, may your peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. O Lord, we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy. Make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim, who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim.
and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin monio, manin monio, manin monio, nite moro rojo chayu kodisho, unachenna lainu ar korbono hono. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences, so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather, make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith with blameless lives and with purity and holiness. May they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Marin, St. Aritas, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people, <coughs> may we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember. 
Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. deceitful ways, and do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el kulchun, wa'am rucho dilo. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies 
cleansed and sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassion and We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el kolukhun wa'am rucho diloch. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.
Give you.